Kuratata, everybody. Um, Bruce Arrell is my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. And tonight we're going to be talking about COVID uh, and the elderly and residential health care. Uh, so we've got a great lineup. I've uh, got 900 people signed up for tonight, so we're delighted with the numbers. Uh, first speaker is going to be Dr. Stuart Jenkins, who's uh, in the GP liaison for the Northern region at the moment. So it's going to talk about what's planned for future webinars. Stuart. Thanks, Bruce. I just wanted to talk to um, the next couple of webinars. We did have one planned for next week around long COVID. We've delayed that. Uh, the reason for that is that while there is a pathway up on Health Pathways, and I'd encourage you to have a look at that and familiarise yourself with it, it is based on Delta data. Um, I think it's still um, able to be used, um, but we're still getting some clarity from the Ministry of Health around um, general um, strategy around long COVID. And so we'll delay that out for fortnight from now. Um, we're also um, going to provide a, a webinar on, on a, a winter plan. This is around um, how to manage not just COVID, but RSV, influenza, and other common winter conditions. So um, we'll provide you with information on the, the next um, couple of webinars in due course. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, Thank, thanks, Stuart. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Christine McIntosh, who'll be well known to you. Uh, Co-clinical director, uh, COVID-19 community isolation and quarantine, uh, better, better known as Farnow HQ. Uh, so over to you, Christine. Yeah, Bruce, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, just really keen to provide you with a bit of an update from the Fano HQ perspective and just really thinking about what might be really helpful at the moment now sort of coming off the peak that we've been at in Auckland and really seen quite remarkable numbers of cases of Omicron in our community. And I'm sure everybody's feeling pretty tired at this moment in time, but actually I think that you can be really proud of your efforts. And so I think that uh, what would be really helpful for you is actually see some of the data. And so uh, I've put together some slides tonight really to um, just to, to give a bit of an overview about what things are looking like. Um, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that um, a lot of the uh, way that we've approached Omicron in the north, uh, in, in Metro Auckland is using the risk stratification tool, the COVID uh, triage tool. Um, and just to let you know, as I have in previous talks, that um, we were always going to keep revising this as we had more and more case data and admissions data to keep on top of it. And as you will know, if you've joined in previous uh, webinars, the original model was based on our Auckland Delta data. And we knew that Delta was different to Omicron. And, um, and so we, um, data scientists have continued to update this model. So if you've been looking at that, what you might have noticed is some changes this week. Uh, the risk of hospitalization tool has been updated and there are some new variables in there. So the new variables that have been included is a better and more depth look at the immunosuppression and the way that it's doing that is it's looking at the dispensing of medications for people in our community. It's also got better markers around cancer and it's looking for any referrals to medical or radiation oncology and any GP read codes on any referrals that are made and through your discharge summary, sorry your, your admissions or your referrals. Um, it also looks at number of hospital admissions, it looks for unique medications dispensed and looks for polypharmacy. Uh, it also, um, actually the alcohol and drug history and recent antibiotics were actually removed because with the increase looked at looking further at other factors, they were no longer significant in the model. And um, the other main change in the model is age has a much lower predictive power because there are other things that have been put in the, into the model now, including the multiple admissions and polypharmacy, which means that age is no longer as predictive um, within the model, which might be very interesting and relevant to tonight's talk. Um, just to remind you, if you haven't already found your way to the PHO uh, lists that are sent out twice a day to your practice, or you can retrieve them from your PHO um, link. Um, these are your risk of hospitalizations, the COVID triage tool, which enables you and your practice to be able to sort your patients by um, risk of hospitalization. 
and you should be using utilizing these lists to really prioritize those people that you call and just be very clear within the hubs that what we have focused on is those people at highest risk of um, hospitalization so that was point two or more relative risk of hospitalization or 20 percent or more risk with some now that the numbers are lower we are increasingly going into the medium risk category but not into the low risk category and we're safety netting around those um, just really to give you some data, as I promised, um, the first graph on the left is really looking at the Omicron outbreak. So that was really J January through to early March. And in that we could see that there was a, um, a, a the outbreak was um, very much with the Pacific population. And, uh, and but as time has gone on, and if you look at the data on the uh, chart to the right, you can see that actually it's now um, the highest case numbers amongst the European population and uh, lower in the Pacific and Māori population compared to earlier in the outbreak. Uh, we're still um, happy from a uh, testing point of view, although we all acknowledge that not all positive rapid antigen tests are getting reported, there is still high testing in our community and high reporting. And, um, and there is some general satisfaction with the level of reporting amongst the Māori and Pacifica population as well. So just, I think, really interesting to look at and actually looking at the rates of admission between population groups and the reason why we've had a prioritised approach around Māori and Pacifica populations um, throughout the outbreak. Um, this is looking at, sorry, um, at the age, and as you can see, still the um, we have a lot of our cases occurring in the younger age groups, um, and really important just to look at the risk of hospitalisation by those age groups, and um, just recognising, yes, the risk of hospitalisation is high, much higher as you get older, particularly as you get into the older, older age groups, uh, but uh, the risk of hospitalisation tool, it does not report back on people who are under the age of 18, and that's because a lot of the markers for risk um, are, are, are less well recorded in the data for under 18 year olds, but actually there is very little reason to, to report that because in fact the risk in younger people, as we all knew with um, earlier versions of uh, COVID, are, are very, very low. Uh, it, admission rates by binned predicted risk. Um, so what this means, this is a 1 to 10% risk, 10 to 20% risk, 20 to 30 and so forth. You can understand the different bins here. And in the original Delta model, what we saw is this went up to, you know, 90 at the top, you know, the nine, between 90 and 100% risk of admission. And what we can see with Omicron is in fact, as, as we all know, Omicron is not as severe as uh, is Delta and so um, we are seeing a, a, a shallower curve than what we saw with Delta. And uh, what we can see from this also is that our low risk group is a very large group of people and the risk of admission within that group is uh, very, very low, 0.67%. The high risk group is from point two upwards, which is this group uh, here and upwards. And this is when we're, the majority of the focus has been, but with some prioritized focus within the medium risk group here. Um, really important to um, contrast uh, our um, outcomes, I think, with um, outcomes other places in the world. And as we know, Hong Kong had a reasonable way of, it reason, had didn't, done reasonably well at keeping um, COVID out of the population, but now they have Omicron. And what is distinctly different between um, Hong Kong and New Zealand is that only, um, only about a third of the over 80s are vaccinated. Uh, so, and we can see the massive difference in um, fatal case fatality rate for the older population compared to our highly vaccinated New Zealand population, and this is the best advert I've ever seen for vaccination. Okay, so how are our uh, vaccination um, uh, rates uh, impacting on our admission rates? Here you can see that being uh, fully vaccinated, which means boosted, um, is very, very effective to protect against uh, admission, including in our older age groups, and it's highly protective compared to being unvaccinated. And also, that difference actually exists in the younger age groups as well. But it's obviously nowhere near as great a difference. Okay, um, 
Now, I just really wanted to talk from a primary care point of view about how you're prioritising your care. Um, it's important to note that for those low risk category groups, that actually, as I have said several times, the risk of admission, which is a marker of severity of disease, is incredibly low in our low risk category. And whilst GPs can tell me of occasional episodes of being concerned about um, those people in the low risk category, actually, the vast majority of people are very doing well and managing well at home and uh, not having severe illness. Um, just admission rates by ethnicity is very similar to the one I've showed before. Admission rates by comorbidities relevant when we're thinking perhaps of the older populations, the more comorbidities are, the more likely you are to be admitted. And admission rates by number of medications. Again, um, the more medications you are, the more likely you are to be admitted. You're more fragically, uh, more medically fragile. So that was um, some data from Auckland. Um, most of that data was just from the last two weeks, actually, which is um, about half of the outbreak numbers. Um, just some really important reminders for primary care, um, just to reassure you about that low risk group. Uh, everybody who has a valid cell phone number is getting a text message the moment that they, well, very soon after they register their positive RAT result or you register their RAT result or they get a PCR result at the lab or at the hospital. And this is the message they get in their positive text result. And uh, so they are given advice of what to do so they can go to the advice line and then they can go and do their contact tracing form, which actually asks about the symptoms as well. And the, um, this chart on the right tells you uh, how many people have not accessed that self-service, self-serve form in the, um, uh, as a result of getting that positive message. And what I think you can see here is this is 200 here. This is today. So these are people who haven't yet answered for today. But what you can see is in general, the response rate to the self-serve is really, really good. It's going really well. Okay, so what I would tell you is if you have finding that you're spending time texting out to, out to your uh, low risk patients, I would say there is already, already a text in place and the majority of patients are answering their self-serve responses there. And what we're hoping to do in the near future is to enable those responses to be able to um, come through on your new case list each day so that you can look at those results. Okay, so just in, um, in summary, really, um, the key points are that the risk stratifying approach in Auckland is working really, really well, and it's put us in good stead, and we have um, comparatively low admission rates. Um, that low risk is indeed low risk, um, and Omicron is certainly not as severe as Delta. And also, people have had some concerns about pregnant women, but actually the majority of pregnant women are doing well through Omicron. Uh, vaccination is clearly the best way to protect the elderly and the more vulnerable. And what our aims really are is I, what I, why I've been stressing the low risk um, and, and just realising that low risk really are low risk is that um, please do feel free to not do much at all of anything for low risk people. Let them seek help if they need it but actually get on with as much back to business as usual as you're able to do. And in fact, have a rest if you want to as well. And I would encourage you in that way, because the numbers are lower now, you know, look, we have capacity within our um, Fano HQ hub. If you want to put that yellow flag up at the weekend, please do put that yellow flag up so that you can have a break. And our team will do that work of ringing those people who are more moderately unwell that you're really concerned about at the weekend. Okay, that's enough from me, but Phil, I've got your slides coming next. Shall I stop sharing now? But I'll be ready for those if you need them. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. Pretty fascinating stuff to see all, see all that data. Um, yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Nikki Turner, who's head of the Immunisation Advisory Centre and an honorary professor in the Department of General Practice and Primary Healthcare at the University of Auckland. So she's also in our department. So Nikki, over to you. Ah, kia ora koutou, Bruce. Is that sharing okay? Yep, that's perfect. Cool. So I'm going to inflict just for a few minutes, everybody, enthusiasm for vaccines. I hope you're not feeling too tired because vaccines clearly are the best thing since sliced cheese at the moment, and particularly for the elderly. Um, so if we can move along. Yes. So firstly, this is just early data. This is before Omicron. And as Christine's pointed out, Omicron's not so severe. But the trends are just the same. This is actually interesting European data, figuring out how much vaccination would save deaths. 
and you can just see the amount of saved deaths from institutionalized frail elderly over 75, 65 to 74 versus right down the bottom, younger people. So the hugely, hugely big gains from vaccination for the elderly is, is really, really clear. And so they estimate here vaccinated people per saved death. Now, this was in the early days. It's probably slightly less with, the, uh, with Omicron, but the trend is exactly the same. So just in case anybody is not yet convinced, that was the modelling. Now, did it change with Omicron? So there's a couple of important differences about Omicron. If you look at the graph here, you can see that the effect of vaccination against symptomatic infection is less with Omicron compared to Delta. So we have lost quite a bit of vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic infection. However, in contrast, if you look at Delta and Omicron on this side, you can see that the vaccine that we're currently using holds up really well against severe disease. And so as we all know, Originally, people were hoping that we'd get a lot of serializing antibodies, we'd reduce transmission, and we'd stop transmission. Well, we're way past believing that now. We, you know, clearly we're the living example of the fact that this bug is transmitting. So vaccination does have effect against transmission, but the major component at the moment is effectiveness against severe disease. So that's the key message at the moment. Um, so the thing I wanted to stress about vaccination is the importance of what we're now trying to call a three dose course, which is the two primary plus the booster. And so if we call it a three dose course, people don't start getting panicked that they're going to need boosters forever more, because there's a lot of young people fear out there that we're just going to keep inflicting more and more boosters on them. So at this stage, a three dose primary course. Now, I really like these little sound bites. This is some US CDC data looking at a period in January, which was an Omicron predominant period in the States. And if you look at the incidence of unvaccinated people getting Omicron disease, they were two times higher than vaccinated without a booster, 3.6 times higher than fully vaccinated with a booster. But the compelling data is unvaccinated people's incidence of hospitalization is 23 times higher than fully vaccinated with a booster. Now, the importance of the booster here is you can see that it's only 5.3 times higher than vaccinated without a booster. So the real message for us is the primary course of two is not enough. Look at the enormous gains you get with Omicron from a primary course plus a booster. So my message for all of us is I know we're feeling completely worn out at the moment, but can we go out there and find everybody we can, particularly elderly, Māori and Pacific, who have not yet been boosted? Now, you know, I still find it interesting that overall we've still got low rates for some people, even from the primary course, but you can see there's still quite a gap to get the booster in for Māori, for Pacific, for, and, and across the board, European has probably closed the gap the most. So there's still a lot of legwork to do in getting that booster into people. And if you remember the 23 times reduction for people who are vaccinated plus boosted, it's worth really trying to force and get out there and try and boost particularly older people. So this is also um, 65 years and plus now, you can see that we've still got a long way to go, interestingly, particularly for Pacifica people. So I know we've done really well in the 80 years and plus, but I think we've still got a lot of legwork to do for the slightly younger, older people. And um, keep going and don't give up looking for people to boost. And yeah, we wanna put the effort of boosting into everybody, but the, the gains for hospitalization are for older people. Um, so quickly, I wanted to say that vaccination, much as I like the principle of vaccination, does not stand alone. And we need to remember that it has to be in association with all our other NPIs. And the, I like this little quote here, that a vaccine which gives 90% efficacy against disease can still result in high population mortality in the absence of efficacy against transmission or non-pharmaceutical intervention. So that's the point of not giving up on all our other important messages. You know, I know people are fed up with it, but we need to keep going with our mask wearing, our social distancing, our red and green lines, you know, people staying at home when they're symptomatic and ring vaccination of high risk people and high risk groups. So it's got to walk in tandem together. Vaccination alone is not the strategy. Um, so I really think we've got to think very hard 
about our patient protection measures, particularly for our frail elderly and our general practices. Long term, not just now, we're heading into the flu season. Long term, I think we should have been thinking about this even before COVID, how to protect our frail people against respiratory illnesses. We've learned a great deal in the COVID environment and we don't want to undo all that we've learned. So my key points, I think everybody's very aware that elderly are extremely high risk. The more frail, the more at risk, as Christine has beautifully outlined. mRNA vaccines are extraordinarily effective um, to um, promote immune response and, and immunosenescence, i.e. people like me and older whose immune systems aren't that great. So mRNA vaccines are fantastic. Two doses alone are only modestly effective better in severe disease, a booster dose makes a big difference. Um, the shorter intervals are not ideal. We wouldn't ideally have liked three months, but that was needs must when Omicron was on top of us. But our focus at this point is on reduction of severe disease. So boost, boost, boost to prevent severe disease. Think about ring protection as well. Even when you've got vaccinated, boosted elderly, how can we ring protection? them with household and close contact protection and think about your broader community protection approach. I'm advocating that we're talking about a respiratory illness protection approach going forward, COVID, flu, RSV, all the nasty respiratory viruses, you know, we can do better than we have been doing. And just touching on what's the likely future, yes, are we going to need a second booster? Many people will be aware the UK have introduced it for the very elderly. Israel have done a slightly different strategy. I think it's very likely soon that we're going to need a targeted second booster, probably by age and comorbidities. Do we need one for frontline providers? There is no urgency yet. I think we can relax a bit. The vaccine is still working very well against severe disease. Um, remembering the vaccine has some effect against transmission, but not a lot. So let's go for a, a respiratory approach to life, considering long-term thinking about protection against flu and COVID. And I'm going to stop there and share my slides with Eric, who's my famous cat, who's been helping me get this preparation together. Thanks very much. Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, that's great. Yeah, I think one of the things we've learned about this uh, pandemic is that your immune system uh, weakens as you get older, which is, of course, going to get us all eventually. So, okay. So our next uh, next speaker is Dr. Mari Todd. She's a geriatrician, Auckland District Health Board part-time geriatrician at Bupa, and she's going to talk about um, assessing and managing people in aged residential care. Over to you, Marie. I'm going to be talking a little bit about aged care. I'm learning at the same rate as everybody else is learning um, with my experience with COVID. That's a general warning. Um, so I can't talk about diagnosis and treatment without having a plug for Nikki and her colleagues about prevention. And so it's never too late. Um, the thing about older people coming into residential care, they keep being admitted and some people sort of will have missed in the cycle. So keep looking out for their vaccine status. We're trying to boost as we find people as they're going in, but keep an eye on that. A brief comment about people who have lost capacity. Um, we've had a few issues about relatives who are very anti-vax. I take a strong line and say that if somebody is always kept up with their vaccinations, that's a strong indicator of their uh, indication of prior wishes. And you need to have quite a, a, a conversation along those lines about the who can make the decision making, even when somebody's got lost capacity, because we were trying to do what mum or dad would have usually made the decision to do. And also all our other infection control um, measures are really, really important. So I can't, can't emphasize that enough for aged care because once it gets into a care home with an outbreak, it is miserable. And I think with there's more guidance that's just come out about rat testing for aged residential care yesterday. And I think the frontline workers need to be doing um, regular uh, testing there. Um, so one of the key points about diagnosis for frail older people is that you've got to have a high index of suspicion. Whilst the majority of people will present with typical symptoms, you've got to be very aware that in this group, illness presents atypically. And one of the key things to watch out for is if somebody is sleeping more than usual, they're less active than usual, 
the quieter, not participating, just not themselves, be afraid. And particularly if there's another couple of people that are sort of just off, but don't seem to have much, do a test. Um, and um, others might talk about the stop and watch tool, which you can read along the sign. That's something that the nursing staff should be using as well in routine daily practice to detect signs of acute illness in older people because these things come positive before changes in temperature, pulse or anything else for any illness. Um, people can also become go off their food, get GI symptoms, a little bit of diarrhea. Um, but most of the people I've seen um, with Omicron have had a minor upper respiratory tract infection and then they start coughing a little bit more vigorously. But in this residential care population where there's a high proportion of people with dementia, um, they may not complain of symptoms. So you're very, you have to train the staff to be highly vigilant um, and people need to do daily symptom checks as well, just to check that people are okay. And remember, people may be positive and asymptomatic. So, you know, high index of suspicion and rat test anybody that's positive. If somebody has respiratory symptoms and the rat test is negative, I think in this setting, it's really important to get a PCR test or at least repeat the rat test um, because it may be negative when there's a low, low viral load or they're very early in their disease. Um, if there's other residents that are symptomatic, obviously get them tested as well. But I think particularly in the early phases of an outbreak, it's really important to identify all of the residents and all of the staff that are positive so that you can put in your maximum infection uh, control strategies. Um, and for those of you who work in aged care and there is an outbreak, all of the homes should really have a good um, process that should, they should follow in notifying their local um, older people's health program managers, public health, so that there's a little team that can help them work through this. Um, just for uh, to give you some idea of the size of the problem at the moment, Bupa has about 48 care homes in New Zealand. Uh, 30 of them have, a, uh, have an outbreak at the moment. We, as of Tuesday, we had something like 400 positive residents, about 460 positive staff. And the vast majority of people have had fairly minor illness. Um, Rick might talk a little bit more, but certainly in our dementia units where um, it's really hard to contain it and everybody's had it. Um, uh, people were quieter, sitting around more, not pacing so much. But, you know, by 9, 9.30, the nurses had everybody up and dressed and in the lounge. Everybody was getting really good um, regular, you know, food and um, food supplements and fluid rounds and, um, and care. But it's major hard work when they have a fraction of their usual staff on. So all sorts of people have been helping out, including our head of IT has been actually at the front line doing patient uh, clinical care. Um, and just at the moment, out of those 400 or so uh, residents, we've got about a 3.7% mortality, but that's all the deaths, that's, that's of the people who are positive with COVID, that's the rate of death, but they're not necessarily COVID related deaths. We've had some sudden cardiac deaths and other, you know, people dying of other things who coincidentally got COVID. But I just thought I'd mention that raw data, just sort of have a feel of what the what it's like in aged care. And I think that's pretty remarkable um, when you take into account their comorbidities. So I think when somebody does become positive, it's important to sort of assess their severity and really strongly think about the goals of care and what you can and can't do for people. Now, it's really important not to lump everybody together. The older people in residential care range from people who have got 
a musculoskeletal or neurological problem and are otherwise fit and robust but need care to people who are dying of other things or often dying of three competing causes at the same time pre-COVID. So some of them will benefit from admission if they get persistently hypoxic or done well. They may well benefit from being admitted to get the therapy and the support that they need. Um, some people won't tolerate any form of um, therapy. So, you know, trying to get um, oxygen onto them to support them or budesonide or anything may well be futile. And some people will die. And I think it's clearly really important that we have good lines of communication with families so that when people become positive, we're talking to the, talking to the family, um, working out what the person will need, what the family know about, what the likelihood is, you know, make sure that the big what ifs have been covered so that we've not got mismatch expectations. And so generally the nurses will be doing daily um, uh, oxygen saturations and pulses and symptom checks and temperatures. And we're looking for people who have got um, O2 sats less than 93%, unless they've got um, chronic COPD where the O2 levels might be a bit lower. So make that decision about what pathway they're going to be on. So this is my simplistic approach to treatment options really for people in, in care homes. Um, if you're hypoxic but can manage um, nasal prongs, we want dry oxygen, not humidified oxygen um, at one to four litres per minute, but with a goal of 92 to 96%. So if it's sitting up at 100%, they need to reduce it. So you'll need to just write it up so that the nurses are clear about how to manage it. And be very aware of the people that might be CO2 retainers and just put a different oxygen level goal there. And remember people that might be have quite dense hemiplegias, not ventilating, some of those can be CO2 retainers. Um, so just think about those sort of people plus the people that are on sedatives um, already. So they may um, uh, be a bit more at risk of hypoxia and CO2 retention when you start giving oxygen as well. So this is from the Ministry of Health guidelines about budesonide. Um, so if you're not hypoxic in the first 10 um, days and you'll fulfill those criteria, so basically anybody that's in a care home, um, it's worth considering whether you can actually physically get this into them. Um, if you can, um, prescribe it. Um, dexamethasone, I think you need to be very careful. Some people might think about using, um, so if you're in hospital and you've got a persistent oxygen need, we will often put people on dexamethasone. I think you've got to be think very carefully in these very frail people. Because if you're going to go that far, you might ask, do they actually need to be in hospital getting the support? So just be mindful of the downsides of that, which is delirium, changes in mood. Um, Frank, you know, you can make the glucose go very high. Um, and so sometimes the side effects of it may be more troublesome than not doing it and having other supportive measures there. So I think it's it's debatable. There may be some cases where you people absolutely don't want to go into hospital that have otherwise got good quality of life that you might try that for for the uh, guidelines, which says for I think it's 10 days. In general, these people don't need antibiotics and you shouldn't be giving coexistent antibiotics. Sometimes when I've looked at um, respiratory outbreak in our care homes with things like RSV, sometimes they had 100% co-prescribing of antibiotics even when we knew it was RSV. So please restrain yourselves there. The people that get secondary bacterial infections seem to be late in the course. So you'll get the time frame and deterioration that for people that might get the COVID pneumonitis at sort of day five, six, seven or so. People that are around about day 10 or 14 may be the ones that are getting secondary bacterial infection. So there seems to be two or three different phases there. 
um, comorbidity management. Um, the first thing to think about is also, uh, do they have coincidental COVID? So they may be COVID positive, but they're unwell because of something else. So don't forget that little trap. Um, so the, this is a group of patients that are often unstable and can deteriorate with all other, other sorts of things. So just bear in mind, is this just COVID or is there something else going on? So we're seeing a lot of patients in hospital that are coming in with all sorts of things. Um, and they also just happen to have COVID. Um, so just think about that. In terms of thinking about um, management, think about some of the comorbidities that might become destabilized when they've got an acute infection. So things like heart failure and people on diuretics, if they're not drinking and they're getting a bit dehydrated, you know, anticipate that and maybe do something about the frusamide for a day or two or three. Um, COPD, we're not using nebulizers. I'm sure you've all got that message um, and it's usual treatment for exacerbations. Uh, think about diabetes if you've got um, people on insulin um, who might um, have, you know, the acute illness will push the sugars up. Um, you might need to have some flexible um, arrangements there to cover the, the highs. Um, we've been caught out a few times when people in care homes are on dialysis, going off to dialysis centres, when people forget to tell the dialysis centre that they've actually got COVID. So in the rush of an outbreak, think about um, your people that have got special conditions um, or special high needs things. So dialysis is one. Um, there are some patients who have got um, increased respiratory risk of aerosolizing um, bugs to everybody else, as well as being high risk. You know, if they've got bad respiratory illness and they catch COVID, we need to be really thinking about doubly protecting them um, from catching it in the first place. There's some advice out there that if people are on CPAP for obstructive sleep apnea at night, that they need a different mask. But I think that's really dependent on expertise and availability of things. And basically, if they are on that, um, shut the door <laughs> at night when they're on their um, CPAP and that's going to be and have good ventilation, that might be a good enough practical start. Um, just have a think about anybody that's on who's got uh, tracheostomy and maybe seek advice if, if you've got any of those patients. Um, sometimes um, because they're needing so much suctioning, they're at high risk if they get infection or they're, they're high spreaders. So you might think about whether they need to go into hospital um, during that outbreak. So just talk to whoever um, whichever specialist service you've got involved with people like that. Marie, can you start wrapping up? We're just running yep. short of time. Oh, thanks. Last slide. So supportive care is basically all the usual things that you do with um, frail older people. Support the team, really important. This is hard yakka for the frontline staff. Fluids, I think oral is the preferred means. When you start thinking about subcuts, for large numbers that puts a real burden on the nursing staff that you haven't got enough people to do those sort of things. Um, people should be up and about as per usual, having their usual routine, you know, getting good sleep, um, all those sort of things. If they become delirious, there's no evidence that antipsychotics actually help in delirium. Um, so try not to add anything extra there. And a final word about moderately severe COVID of new admissions, the severe ones that we're seeing coming to us for rehab are really wiped out. And so a lot of them need residential care and they seem to take a long time to get going. So I think a very slow rehab approach to them is what's really critical. And that's it. Okay, Marie, thank you very much for that. Um, lots of valuable points there. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Rick. Barber, GP with an interest in the health of older people. And uh, he's going to talk about practical experience of dealing with COVID-19 with vulnerable older people in residential care. Over to you, Rick. Great, thanks, Bruce. Um, so I um, work with Marie Todd in a BUPA facility in Beach Haven, which we had uh, 100 residents. 
And uh, it took, I think we had a, a case on day one and then by the second day there were 15 case, positive cases. And then by the third day, I think 40 cases. Um, and we'd had a little bit of a think about how we were gonna manage um, an outbreak. Um, and in the sort of preparation we were doing, we thought about all the, the type of um, clients that we have, which are primarily psychogeriatric group. Um, and as such, most of them were on the, uh, on the sort of palliative care route. And um, so Heather and I um, looked at what we had available to us and looking through the health pathways for palliative care in COVID um, is pretty much the same as palliative care for any end stage respiratory illness. And our options, as, as Maria said, is really around oxygen, um, hydration, um, and perhaps some of those other things like budesonide on the health pathways. But really, um, as, in, um, as all the data have been shown already, pretty much all of our cases were mild. Uh, so mild upper respiratory tract infections. We had um, two whose oxygen saturations dropped. One and one gentleman had pre-existing severe um, heart failure and the other gentleman um, was a chronic asthmatic uh, COPD, but they managed absolutely fine with um, oxygen for uh, three or four days and are recovering well. We um, have had two deaths, which are probably coincidental. So sudden, sudden um, events um, in, in, so rather than a slow respiratory decline, they were really sudden, um, a drop in blood pressure and probably um, coincidental. So most likely a, a myocardial infarct and, 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 a, and a stroke. Um, the biggest issue was the staffing. So uh, something like 80% of the care staff got sick with COVID and were mandated to go home. And um, so there's no one to do the basic work, like uh, like the laundry and um, the basic care work. And as Maria has already intimated, the the IT staff volunteered, and Marie has done a whole lot of shifts. Um, I did one and managed to get sick uh, whilst doing it. Um, but really, it was the basic care of changing beds and feeding people so that the nurses could get on with uh, their medication rounds and so on. Um, but happily, a week down the track, um, everyone's doing well now, to be completely honest. And so thanks to high vaccination rates and boosters, it has been relatively manageable. Um, the other thing I guess I was going to say is that it, as far as controlling spread within the wards, it was, it was impossible. So with the, um, the type of um, patients we have, trying to pin them down or isolate was impossible as they, they wandered, they tend to wander throughout the ward and mix with other uh, patients. Um, and so it did just really take hold uh, like wildfire really, but thankfully um, due to vaccination, it's, it's been completely manageable. So it's very comforting, Rick, to hear that um, basically it was relatively smooth sailing because uh, we did wonder what may happen um, in these residential care facilities. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Michael Boyd, a nurse practitioner, um, who many of you will have known from her time at White Matar. Uh, she's going to also talk about practical experience of dealing with COVID-19 and vulnerable older people in aged residential care. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, it's I've been living and hopefully not breathing COVID for the last um, three weeks. It's been quite amazing. And I see Phil's on this um, call and I'm covering for Phil while he's away. And the day after he left, his facility went positive. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> so that's great. So um, does, I just basically looked at our data. We have five facilities. Uh, four out of the five facilities have positive cases. We have a total of 258 residents. So 13% of those uh, residents were positive. About there were 34 positive. Actually, I have to say, as of this afternoon, I did these yesterday, I have 40 now, unfortunately. 
um, we have um, one death. And I wanna talk a little bit about this death. We had no hospital, we had no hospitalizations. Um, we had three unvaccinated people total. Um, the DHB, I, I, I have to give them all credit for getting everybody vaccinated and boosted in such a efficient and great manner because I think that's made a huge, huge difference to our experience. But I, I agree with Marie, the, the ethics around somebody who is against vaccinations saying for their older person that they have to sign this form to say they can get vaccinated saying no, I, I have a real ethical issue with that. Um, so we had four severe cases. Um, so the severe cases, uh, so we had the majority of people uh, were moderate. They had symptoms, they had fever, they were pretty lethargic for a few days. 23% had really mild and you didn't even know they were sick, most of them. But this, this um, we had four cases that were very sick. Two of the cases, so one of the cases passed away, died. Uh, two of the cases, um, I was absolutely convinced that the, both of those people were going to, to die. Got the families in, did the whole two o'clock in the morning Zoom call with mom saying, I love you, mom. And, you know, basically saying that she was going to, you know, say goodbye to her. Um, and what was interesting is if these guys are going to get severely sick, what I've what we've seen is they're going to get severely sick within two days. They're going to get it and get severely sick. Um, but what was really interesting was that by day five, if they're gonna come out of it, they're gonna come out of it about di day five or day six. I have this, uh, a, a woman that, that only speaks Russian and um, I thought for sure, I got her family in, the whole thing, I thought for sure that she was gonna die. Um, and um, the next day she started talking Russian to us again. So, you know, it, they get better really quickly but they go down really quickly as well. I do wanna say a little bit about the rat negatives and um, it's been mentioned before, our average uh, days to rat negative is 14. It's ranging from eight to 22 days. I've got a gentleman right now with, um, who's dying of cancer. So he did get COVID, but he's dying of cancer. So it was incidental. Um, and he's still positive and I think it's day 20. Day 20. Um, so one of the things that's really been incredibly helpful for us is um, for our practice, we try to have a family meeting every six months and talk about all, everything, medicines and how things are going and food and all that. But we also always bring up goals of care, shared goals, whatever you want to call it, ceiling of care, advanced care plans. Um, and so I find that really helpful. Um, the thing that I find really helpful is not just CPR, not CPR. It's really about level of care that we're gonna give. So what, are they for hospitalization? Are they for on-site antibiotics? Are they for, you know, all, the, all of, um, you know, for everything? Um, and certainly we still have those folks. So um, this is from the care guides. I find it really helpful to really get very detailed in the level, not that they know what the, what the person needs, but just to get, get a real gauge of, of how sick that person is. Uh, if that person gets sick, what, how aggressive we're going to get. Now, the woman that did die, we had done this before. This was, she had end stage dementia. Um, anything could have ended her life. She was very frail. Um, so this was extremely helpful to us because we'd already had this discussion. She was not for hospitalization and we were able to provide comfort cares. So just, and this is just a reiteration of what's already been said. It's the pneumonitis that gets them. And, a, and if they're gonna be severely sick, it's the pneumonitis in the, neck, in the first couple of days is what we've seen. Hypoxia is for us the, the signal for somebody who's severely ill. And those have been uh, four, maybe five people. A fever, poor fluid intake is really um, one of the biggest things for us. Um, antibiotics are ineffective. We talked about that. And then um, comfort medications. That was the other thing that was quite surprising is that the comfort medications actually, the, the two people that were, I thought for sure were end of life, started the comfort medications. And the next day uh, they both kind of popped out of it. So we stopped the subcut morphine and midazolam. Um, we've already talked about the steroid treatment. Um, we called the ID specialist at the hospital when we first became positive. 
and and he did actually recommend that we try some dexamethasone with those two people, the three people that were really ill. And we did with three people that were very, very hypoxic. And we're talking hypoxic in the 70s. You know, they were really sick, did not expect them to live. Um, the other, so we, we did have them on oxygen. I will say the canisters work a whole lot better than the concentrators. The other thing that we noticed quickly is um, the transit, there was some transit bradycardia um, in four people that I didn't expect at all. That was quite surprising. Um, and they were asymptomatic. They didn't even know they were, had it. You know, it was one of those things. It was just, we were getting the OBS and it was like, why are there, why was their heart rate in the forties? Um, there's very little literature on this, but there is some literature on it. Um, it's thought to be due to cytokine effect on the SA node. All of them resolved within a day, um, but it was quite interesting. And last not, but not least, um, the isolation, we're tired of oh, isolation. One of the hardest things for me personally is the dealing with the family. I need to come in and see my family. I need to come in and see my family. It, we're different. We, our family is different than everybody else. We have to go in and see our family because we're different. Um, and that gets really old being the policeman. Um, and the staff get it. I think the staff really get the grief from the families for that. Um, but the, the residents themselves, they don't have the outside entertainment. They, don't, they have fewer activities. They can't have dinner with each other. They're just lonely. I, you know, it's really hard. And we know loneliness takes its toll in older people. So, I, you know, is the treatment now for Omicron, not for Delta and not at the beginning, but is the treatment now worse than the disease and the isolation? And I, I'm beginning to think it is. Um, the other little anecdote really is that the, old, the older buildings that we work with versus the flash new hotel looking things, um, they seem to have a bigger spread quicker than the new buildings. I don't know if it's a ventilation thing. Uh, I don't know, but it was just an interesting kind of um, observation that I've just wondered about. Or is it that they have different staff and they did things differently? I will say one last thing, and that's that the rats are two days behind. <laughs> so the person, if they have any kind of runny nose or they're tired or they're whatever, that rat is not gonna show up either in the employee or the older person for two days. So where I see the facilities doing the best is anybody who has any symptoms gets right into isolation and then often we'll see that rat show up positive. It might be negative that first day, but it's positive uh, a couple of days later. And they've just saved us from having a full spread. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of my experience. I hope that was helpful. Thanks, Michael. That's very interesting about the comfort treatments. I haven't heard them refer to that as before, but um, nice that they worked. Maybe a little bit of comfort's a good idea. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, it's a great pleasure. I get to introduce my uh, colleague of about 25 years and good friend, Nari Kirst, who's um, a professor in our department and holds the Joyce Cook Chair in Aging, uh, in aging Well. She's so all about aging well, and I think you're aging well, Nari. So over to you. Well, I'm not so sure I'm aging well after I went tramping, pretending that I'm 20 again and came back with uh, everything sore. Um, and we were so slow, we had to camp in the riverbed instead of getting to the hut. But that's another story. Look, I want to um, just talk for a few minutes about the, rel the rest of the older people. So we've heard a lot about age residential care. They are a special group. In New Zealand, we have 715,000 roughly people over the age of 65. That's a reasonably large city. Of those 35,000 are in age residential care and about 40,000 are in retirement villages. So the rest of them are what John Campbell, who's one of my mentors used to call free range. Um, now, when you think about the absolute, uh, the, the numbers of age group, over 75 is perhaps relevant for us a lot because they tend to need more attention and over 85. So over 75 is about 630,000 and over 85 is 84,000. So those oldest age group are relatively rare. This is the group, of course, that will increase by four times over the next sort of 20, 25 years. So they're an increasing 
um, an increasing group. But in your practice, if you think about people over age 75, on the average 2,000 person practice, there'll be about 150, there's not that many. So I would argue that you have time to give a little more attention to those who are older and particularly over 75 in your population. Now, this population has been restricted for two years. Talked to my mother-in-law the other day in Ashburton, she's 90. She hasn't had her blood pressure taken for two years because they're still not seeing people in the practice face to face. So they also have had restricted social occasions and restricted activities because things have closed down. They've had very little care and prevention from us, the primary care people. And I think it's time that we got back into this. Yes, we're having an Omicron uh, wave. Yes, it's getting a little bit better in Auckland. But those older people really deserve our care and attention to invest in their own well-being. So Age Concern does a random sort of survey of people who answer on the internet. And 66% of those people who are over age 75 said they're not going out much at all, even during this time where the rest of society is kind of opening up. I want to remind you that, um, that the vast majority of older people are relatively robust. So let's talk about frailty a little bit. It's a very good marker or a very good way to differentiate those who need a lot of your attention and those who you can treat as a normal adult, if you like. So when we think about frailty, full frailty, that's where you are slow, have low uh, muscle strength, have weight loss, have more than three out of five of those markers. There's only about 20 to 30% of those in the, in the general population who are frail. If you look at people who are 85, 60% of them will be pre-frail or frail. So the majority of those who are 85, this is justifying more attention to those over 85s because that frail group are those who need more attention with Omicron and with COVID in general. So let's think about Omicron now. That's the wave that we have. Um, so Omicron is in general a mild illness. So I've talked to people, Rick, I love your stories about the residential care facility. People say that they go there and the people with Omicron are sitting up in bed having a cup of tea and then they're getting up to walk about and put their clothes on and tell the staff what to do, which is what they usually do. The difficulties are with the staff. And in the community, people who are older with COVID can be relatively well. They need the usual pastoral and whānau support that Fano HQ deliver absolutely um, wonderfully. So your conversations with your older people with COVID have to be about who they have supporting them, whether there's anybody else at home, whether they have somebody who can deliver the groceries, whether they have their medications, whether the pharmacy will deliver or not. Those are the usual conversations. For those who are not frail with COVID, I think you need to think of them as an average adult and look at your risk stratification. Beautiful data, um, Christine, thank you very much about that the risk stratification is working. Those who are at high risk are high risk of hospitalization and it is regardless of age. So it is the comorbidities that come with age. So for those who are not frail, they are in your purview and they need your attention to their comorbidities. You need to understand their comorbidities, which you will, because continuity with our older patients in New Zealand is very high for primary health care. So understand your patients, manage their comorbidities and understand their support mechanisms at home and nearby. So in general, that's the majority of your older patients. And I want to remind you that the majority of them are well. This effect of being put away or restricting their own activities for two years, I don't think anybody understands the absolute impact of that psychosocially. I think now it is time as we come through this wave that we really need to encourage people to resume their usual pre-COVID levels of physical activity. Physical activity is essential to well-being. It is essential to bodily functions. It is essential to functional status. So let's encourage people to re-engage re with physical activity. Um, so now let's just turn our attention a little bit to the more frail who are in your care in the community. 
They are the people who have cognitive problems, are cared for by a carer. They are the people with significant comorbidities, particularly congestive heart failure, respiratory disease. I did find a, a guideline which will be made available to you, which was published in the MJA, relatively local, which goes through the usual things. It's very similar to our um, pathways, but the essence is to remember the general principles. So remember the proactive con con contact from primary health care to the person with COVID. Remember the early referral. Remember managing the comorbidities. Remember the multidisciplinary team which is available through, you, through older people's health, which can help with the extended um, aspects of uh, management. For COVID-specific management, yes, we've talked about having uh, some budes budesonide or even um, steroids. So remember a low threshold for steroids for those people who become short of breath, a low threshold for oxygen according to the usual um, guidelines. The things that are different about older people than younger people who are getting moderately to severe COVID are delirium, anxiety, agitation. And this is a conversation for the whole family. So that anxiety, we need to be reassuring as much as we can that there is support there, that their hospital is available if needed, and potentially from the community, you have a lower threshold for admission than in aged residential care because of the, relatively speaking, um, lower levels of health services support. Okay, so similarly to Marie's wise words, the goals of care are very important. And any information you can give to the hospital um, the clinicians who you're handing the person on to are very well received, particularly about the goals of care and existing comorbidities. So that's my plug. Remember, in general, your older patients will be relatively well and robust from the frailty perspective. If they are frail, you need to treat them with more attention. And, and now we need to actually think about the social, psychosocial consequences of being shut away for a couple of years for our older population. It's time to get out there. And I really valued Michael's comments about whether it is okay for to exclude visitors or not, and whether we need to be getting back in there. The uh, approach of age residential care is very variable up and down the country and around Auckland to whether people are able to visit with their relatives and their loved ones. And I think that's a, a topic for public debate. Okay, that's it from me, Bruce, back to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I've got some, a few questions there. If um, now there's one there that may, can be answered by the panel um, from Stephanie. How did home care doctors prevent themselves from getting COVID? This is for you, Rick, Michael and Marie. As, as assumed they were wearing, as, as assumed they were visiting. Did they? Did you wear full PPE gear? Yes, <laughs> I can tell you. Yes. Um, yeah. Rick, what about you? So, in my one morning of doing very sweaty care work, um, I went to a party that evening, and I was I had COVID by Monday. So I don't know whether it was the rest time or the party. But I, at the rest time, it was full PPE and changed it three times. I have been blaming the, the rest time because there were so many people unwell, but it, I'm not certain. But I, I did catch it. Marie, what um, about you? I mean, I, I, I don't think doctors should be afraid of visiting care homes. Um, that's part, you know, we need to have our primary care people seeing patients. I think you've got to be meticulous about your... Um, PPE wearing and but I think if you're wearing a really well fitted N95 mask and your visor um, and you're impeccable about your hand washing and you know everything like that I think you can be pretty safe I think it's really hard humans being humans there are often little gaps in what you're doing and what you're touching on the way out and it's, you know, when you're in the middle of an outbreak, it's really hard to keep everything completely, um, you know, clean, particularly in older buildings of care homes that aren't designed, you know, there's been big pushes to make places look homely and all those sort of things, um, when actually <laughs> you need some basic 
um, access to uh, your alcohol and your gloves and everything like that in an easy fashion. So it's not easy. Um, we're humans, but um, I think if you're meticulous about your PPE wearing, I mean, I'm coming across um, unexpected positive patients in my day-to-day -day practice, touch wood. <laughs> I'm still okay, but you know, by the end of the day, I've got you know major imprints all over me. Um, and certainly, you you really need to have somebody watch you put it on and off because I find I'm touching all sorts of things, mm. and yeah. uh, it's embarrassing really when you've got somebody um, sort of watching that. You get um, better. <laughs> Christine just made a comment. There was a few a few questions about budesonide. Christine, do you want to answer those, perhaps? You've answered it in the chat. Um, I, I think what I was going to say is that um, the pedestinate has been taken off the health pathway. And um, the reason for that is the National Technical Advisory Group, I understand, have a thought that it's of uncertain benefit in Omicron. And given that it was a small benefit in Delta, um, and I just wonder if the colleagues on want to comment about your experience of using budesonide and uh, what you would recommend at this point. Um, I think we all learn as we go, don't we? And we have to go, you know, we have to adapt as we go, but I'm just really interested in your thoughts on this. Um. Well, I, I've i put it in because it's still on the ministry um, guidelines. And I, when I looked on the health pathways, I couldn't actually find it. So it may have fallen off. Oh, no, been, it's gone because of that reason. <laughs> okay. Well, we've we've still been using it. I've been aware that it's probably not as good in Omicron as anything, but um, you know, we we we've been still at the beginning of our journey with how people go who are frail and older and with comorbidities, which are the people that I see in the hospital. So we have been trying to use that, and then I've been aware that um, getting supplies is probably um, more of a challenge. And I sort of feel like, because um, I have asthma and I'm on it already, it might help me keep keep well <laughs> as well. Um, so, you know, in, in the aged care setting, it's just for, for many people, it's challenging to get puffs into people and certainly in the dementia unit. I mean, I, you know, I don't think at Beach Haven, it would have given much benefit to anybody to be honest but I've just put it there because it, it is in some guidance and obviously not in the others. Eric's got a question here about um, two puffs QID or four puffs BD to get the 1600. Does anybody have a view on that? Onari's got a hand up. Uh, any others got the hand? I just wanted to respond to another question, which I accidentally um, put it already answered, but I wanted to answer it live. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't about know the, the answer Yeah, so finish the Bunezenide question first and then come back to me. Yeah, sorry. No, so I've, got no I, I, I've got no real comment about that. I mean, the, the, the issue is that you get more of your um, beta agonist, which you might not need. Right, which may be a bit of a problem in older people potentially. Tachycardia yeah. when you're trying to yeah. monitor things. Yeah. Um, uh, so, Nairi, do you want to speak? Um, oh, yeah. So, it was a question, a great question from Dragika about um, frustrated older people, both in the community and in, in residential care, with dementia who can't hear the staff because of the mask. And this is worse with um, when you have people from different cultures and potentially non-English speaking versus, uh, or even non-English speaking patients, uh, residents. And so in that instance, you know, people will work out how to communicate, but if you have, you try, you have to try to match up the person who can communicate with that resident with that resident so that they can have effective communication. You can also use communication boards and you can use amplification for the person who has, who has the hearing loss. And so you have to, communication is really important because anxiety, dementia, confusion, all that is so much worse if the older person doesn't know what the hell's going on and there's all these people walking around in spacesuits. I mean, I really, my heart goes out to them, but it doesn't take very long if you can get a person who can communicate with that person to stick with them um, and try to keep continuity of care staff going through the outbreaks. Of course, that's impossible when that person gets COVID and then has to go off for a week, but everyone does their best. I, 
the other thing is that if you're not in an outbreak situation, but you're still wearing your mask mm -hmm. for your own, your own PPE, I actually take my mask off if, if people are deaf. I think if you, you're spaced there, you've done your symptom screening of people, I think the risk to you is low for that short um, period that you're there and the communication gain is great. Um, so that's, you know, my clinic, I will often get the husband and wife to take their mask off. I might well keep mine off on, but they feel more comfortable talking to me and often deaf people the, the wife who can hear is the inter, you know, interprets, they can hear them shouting, but not me shouting. And so that sort of works as well. Just a comment there about um, masks or glasses. I followed one of our speakers from Australia and got myself a pair of goggles because I got so sick of having to move, to read the computer screen. I was having to move the, move the mask and uh, I find, and you can just wash those masks completely. So I found that ten dollars from Bunnings, ten dollars from my ten, should I say? Um, so mm. I got a question there. Um, as a pharmacist, I've been dispensing budesonide and pulmacort turbo -ala. I don't want a lava use. Uh, if you don't want a lava, use that one. But can the lava improve outcomes? Simbacort instead of pulmacort. Anyone want to take a punt on that one? I don't think it's known. Okay, uh, absence of evidence. Somebody, yeah, somebody, absence might, of evidence. somebody might know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not known. Yeah, it's a summer. It, the whole thing, isn't it? 80%, 20% of medicine's evidence based, and 80% is, um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is uh, the rest. Um, um, so, Bruce, there is no evidence for benefit of Simbacord just simply because, yeah, the evidence was on Pomacord. Pomacord, yep. Cool. A uh, question there about a doctor going back to where we answered that one, have we? So the doctor had, had uh, COVID quite badly, was still negative testing, but still symptomatic at 10 days. Should they go back to work? I don't think anybody should be going back to work feeling unwell. No, good, good, um, yeah. So the rules are that you need to stay at home while you're symptomatic until you're 24 hours, essentially symptom free, although we all realise that you might have a, a, a bit of a post viral cough. Mm. But well, otherwise, we've cold be... the cough, cough lasts three to four weeks, so it'll be a long time off. If, uh, I think, yep. Um... Yeah, but if you're still feeling really unwell, you know, you're feeling unwell, headachey, yeah. feverish and all those sorts of things, then clearly you should not be back at work. Yeah, just to add to that, I think the ministry tightened that up a little bit recently. So um, as Christine says, you need to be symptomatic for 24 hours, whereas before it was a bit more permissive. Okay. Unless you're going off to work with COVID, fellow COVID sufferers. Um, so, you know, in the care homes where um, many places have had to activate their section 70 rules so that if you're positive and you're mildly symptomatic and feel well enough at being at work and you're positive, you can go and work in with positive people. Yeah, and, and I'd like to reiterate that question of who we are protecting here, because if you've had COVID and your day, your 90 days of um, honeymoon period starts in terms of being reinfected, um, we might well be able to get people back to work um, with, with less um, risk to um, providing themselves and to others as well so we're, I'm just waiting for that sort of information to come out actually what should we do in that 90 day grace period there was a bit um, of information came out to, to, to yesterday that might have a little bit of that answer sure um, so um, the, the, the talk of free range humans made me want to remind you to join the uh, come to the Goodfellows symposium this weekend Unfortunately, there's no free range humans. We're hoping to put that on next year. Um, but the advantage with the online version we've got, if you don't like the, the, the talk you're watching, you can go straight over to one on the opposite stream. They're all pre-recorded with people. Uh, the, the presenters will be available at the end for talk. So um, very sophisticated setup there. Um, and I was just gonna just, say, just, just have a last word from Stuart Jenkins just to say about the, uh, we're going to be doing a long COVID webinar. That's one of them. 
And what was the other one? Uh, we're going to talk about um, a, a winter. Oh, winter, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be around, um, part of that will be respiratory protection. So it's taking account of, of um, screening patients, streaming them, triaging how we use PPE and IPC, but also taking account of it's not just COVID we're going to be dealing with, it's going to be influenza, other childhood, you know, childhood illnesses, we may well see the return of RSV and hopefully not measles, but we just need a, um, a broader response. But the other comment is that um, there's inherent risk in being a clinician. And I think we just need to remind ourselves we're all triple jab now. And actually we, we need to, to get back and put the patient at the center. If the patient wants a face-to-face -face consultation, it needs to be a very good reason as to why they won't get one. Um, rather than default to the, oh, look, we'll just we'll do a, a phone consult. I mean, that's not helping their blood pressure. Um, and, and I think this is particularly apparent with um, vulnerable older persons as to just the gap that's opened up. And having been in a conversation today about um, um, the hospital and, and how they start, they've fallen behind in, in, in terms of, whole range of services. Um, if primary care is only working at, let's say, 80% of capacity, which it probably is at the moment, who's the 20% who are missing out? And I suspect there's some large equity issues amongst that. So um, it's just a plea to think about, you know, how you're practicing. Do you really need to, you know, run the practice in the same way as you did 12 months ago. It's quite a different world now. It's a different disease and you're fully immunized. So look, I'd just like to hand over to, to Phil actually for the last word because Phil very um, um, appropriately prompted us to, to run this webinar. Yeah, well, thanks Stuart. And I, I appreciate that. And look, I'd like to acknowledge primary care in particular, the Goodfellow Unit for some excellent, excellent um, webinars over the last few weeks. I'm not a, I'm a geriatrician, not in primary care. So it's a bit of a, bit of a sort of gratuitous statement to say, I have enormous respect for what primary care is doing at the moment. And the, I've ex gained a lot by having um, to experience the, the front end of um, primary care, especially in ARC facilities over the last year or so, and I wouldn't have had that otherwise. It's not a matter of if, but when we are going to get this the Omicron, um, I think, and um, there may be even another more virulent version out there, and not virulent, but more contagious version out there. So we might have to learn to sort of take off those, <laughs> take off all the gear that we've been using and try to get back into real life and doing the face-to-face -to -face mm -hmm. as much as we can. I don't know exactly when that will be, but thank you for being so attentive. Yeah, I'd just like to thank the panel today. I thought it was a terrific session um, some really interesting little things. And I won't forget, Michael, the, uh, the comfort drugs. That, that really, uh, really really tickled my fancy. Uh, I've not, not, not heard that term before, so I've, I've learned a new term tonight. And I learned a lot from all of you, so thank you for the work you're doing, um, obviously under fairly difficult circumstances. So uh, good night, and we'll catch up with you uh, this weekend if you're coming to the symposium. If not, there'll be more uh, webinars coming up in the near future. And thank you to NRHCC for sponsoring this, Stuart and Christine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye.